Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manain, a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John to assist them. And when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. And he was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of righteousness, full of deceit, all deceit and villainy, you, will you not stop making crooked the paths, the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. And immediately mists and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Sovereign grace, spiritual gifts, and the pastor. Sovereign grace, spiritual gifts, and the pastor, where the past, these two things are not pitted against one another or opposing one another, but the pastor, the guy in the middle of it, so to speak, the shepherd has to know how to harness these two things, the sovereignty of God, the grace of God, Spiritual gifts. How does a how should a reformed pastor be charismatic? Only John Piper could write such a title. <laughs> it's not a title, it's a paragraph. How should a reformed pastor be charismatic? Reading that, there's an assumption here underneath that it can be done, that it should be done. In fact, that it must be done, must be done. If we're gonna talk about the gospel in its full orb beauty and power, then these are not optional. These are necessary and vital. How should, how should it happen? How should a reformed pastor be charismatic? As I approach this this morning, I want to address it really in a very broad way. Almost want to take a step back and walk through, if you like, some familiar verses. I, I pray God that they have not become so familiar to you that you have become jaded by them and they no longer touch you, I hope, I hope, I pray that you would be touched afresh by the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen to that? Amen. I want to, in addressing it, also bring you to a practical outworking of some of these things. I won't take a lot of time 
defining every single one of the gifts, because I think that there are very good books out there that can help you do that, but perhaps to walk you through some of my own experiences marinated with Scripture that we may all learn together. And in this talk, I have to say from the outset, I, I make no claims of originality at all. Um, I, I really am standing on the shoulders of incredible giants. I'm so thankful to God, the privilege I've had to have certain amazing men who have walked with God with integrity over a long time. I'm so thankful that the Lord has brought people like that into my life. I think of people like Terry Virgo. I think of people like Jack Hayford. I think of people like John Piper, from whom I learned doctrine and who Jesus is. <laughs> I knew who Jesus is then listening, reading, hearing the things he had to say, at least the bits I understood anyway, because um, uh, it's amazing just when you think you know, it turns out you don't know. And you learn to live in that place for a long time. I don't know, therefore I'm hungry to know. I learned about the centrality of the cross, reform theology, and all of that from the ministry of Pastor John Piper. So for me to be here, to have the opportunity to serve this conference that I've been to a number of times is just um, uh, humbling to me, and I give God all of the glory. And so it's again to God that we go in prayer. That, Father, this will be your time, not mine. That this would be a powerful time, is my prayer. That we all be edified and Jesus be glorified. That we come to the Word and bow down to the Word and stay under the Word so that the power of the Word may wash over us that we become intoxicated by the word, that the Spirit who wrote the word would bring it alive to us again, that we'd be shaken away from complacency and apathy and be freshly tuned and recalibrated to the things that you want us awakened to. I pray that I will speak and be careful with my words, but be forthright that we all may walk this walk well, that Jesus be glorified in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Why would anyone be hesitant, resistant, resistant, towards the Holy Spirit? Why would anyone who is Bible-believing, Christ-centered, and theology-loving be cautious and hesitant about the Holy Spirit? Uh, the more I think about that question, really, when you drill down in the end, it really just, very often it comes down to a number of things, but basically, it's fear. And sometimes they're just irrational fears. Sometimes there are fears that when you hear some of the things that people have gone to, or gone through, and some of the things done to them in the name of the charismatic, well, you kind of understand where they're coming from. I'm going to walk you through seven points here. They're not alliterated or anything like that, so if you, you know, you'll do well to keep up with me. Um, I'll talk about the, my own personal experience a little bit. I'll keep that short, and I'll talk about the biblical mandate. I'll talk about the consequences if we do not do these things and live in the good of these things. I want to talk about the pastor because it starts with you. I want to talk about the people that you pastor and how you ought to do that in light of all of these grand issues. And then I want to talk about the cautions. 
long, long time ago, my wife and I were in a meeting that uh, was a small Christian meeting, you know, and um, had, uh, we had some guy come preach in the, in, the, in, in the church. I wasn't leading the church, but it must have been about, I don't know, maybe 30, 50 of us maybe, and uh, he was a guy who work, walked in the prophetic gifting, you know, and uh, he came, and uh, I was, I was kind of on the leadership thing, but he came, and he preached, and he did his thing, and it was okay, except middle of it, he went to my wife, and he, he had a word for my wife, and his word went like this, your, your husband is hurting you, isn't he? Your husband is not, is not treating you right. Your husband is not taking care of you. Your husband, there are things that your husband is doing that is not, you're not happy. Your husband is hurting you. And God says you need to talk to your husband about that because God says your husband is hurting you. What do you think that kind of thing does to a marriage? I mean, to go to someone's wife and say your husband is hurting you and says, I, God told me, your husband is hurting you. My wife and I, we got back in the car on the way home. I thank God for his grace that kept us because, listen to this, we looked at each other. I said, what was that about? <laughs> exactly what we did. What was that? I'm like, I don't know. You know. I'm, are you, we okay here? She's like. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? And we dismissed it. I am careful not to despise prophecy, but I do recognize nonsense. That's what that was. <laughs> Why would anyone be hesitant about the Holy Spirit? Very often people have had experiences But sometimes it's just personality. They just, I'm not that kind of tongue-speaking, babbling kind of person. I'm a, I'm a nice guy. <laughs> grew, up, grew up in Nigeria. I'm a Nigerian. And, uh, uh, you know, having you get, became a Christian in Nigeria, and uh, I thank the Lord for just the amazing way that he wrenched me out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. But very soon in the church, you begin to realize some things done in the name of the Holy Spirit. You think that doesn't, it just doesn't feel right, but you don't know any better. You certainly don't say anything, so you leave it and let it go. Grow up over time, begin to realize that's just not God because it's hurtful, it's abusive, it's not right. And it takes different forms. Who hasn't seen the television Christian evangelist kind of guy and the stuff he does in the name of the Holy Spirit. And he basically turns God into you know, a magician. What do you want God to do for you? You want God to do that for you? Okay, I, I, we got a prophecy for you. You know, you give a hundred dollars. Yeah, I'm not saying pounds, dollars, because half of them come from your country, by the way. Yeah. You got a hundred dollars and uh, we'll give you a prophecy. It will be like a hot shop prophecy, just like bang on, you know, hundred. If you got twenty dollars, we'll give you, you know, not such a hot shot prophecy, but it'll <laughs> it'll do. <laughs> Who hasn't seen that? Who hasn't been in a meeting where everything seemed good and calm and Christ is being exalted and uh, we're singing in Christ alone and everything is going well and someone takes it upon himself, somewhat dubious, you know, in the back of the row someplace, lifts up his voice and speaks in tongues in such a way that it's just a staccato kind gun, machine gun blabbering that just pierces the atmosphere. And everyone is just scared. Everyone including, look, I'm a black Nigerian charismatic guy. People like me don't scare easy. <laughs> but whenever that kind of thing happens, 
out of sync and just, just out there like that, even I am like, oh, oh, you know? Listen, the gifts, the Holy Spirit wants to free people, not freeze them. So I too have seen the expressions in the name of the gifts of the Spirit that have been just abusive. And sometimes it's just a lack of wisdom, just, a lack, just ignorance, where people just have not been taught. And then, you, of course, you have Christian streams and circles where the weirder it is, the more it is applauded because the tendency to mistake fanaticism for spirituality. And those kinds of experiences is enough to make everyone say, you know what, I just want to love Jesus. I just want to preach the gospel. Just want to be nice, shepherd the flock. All this stuff, I don't know that I want to do that. So the tendency to sidestep. But I want to tell you, the scriptures don't give us that permission. We do not have that option or that permission to say it's just so subjective. Can't get a grasp of this thing and so we sidestep it. We can't do that. We're not allowed to do that. Because there's a biblical mandate. When Jesus Christ, Mark chapter 1, when Jesus, the Bible says, baptized, he comes out, he saw the heavens open, and the Spirit came upon him. I love the way it's rendered in the ESV. The, the heavens just ran it, torn open, something of an urgency, and a deliberate, the Spirit came upon him. This is Jesus. The Spirit came upon him, and this triggered the beginning of his ministry in that dimension. I want to submit to you if he needed the Holy Spirit. It's nothing short of arrogance for us to think, we'll just go. We'll be fine. You won't be fine. The plan is not just for you to go. The plan is for you to go and be fruitful. This same Jesus Matthew chapter 4, the Bible tells us, verse 23, went around all Galilee, went around teaching and preaching in the synagogues and healing every disease and every oppression of the devil. And they brought to him people who were demon-possessed and epileptic, and he healed them. Listen to that. He went around teaching, preaching, healing, delivering. The church in the West basically wants to do only two things, preach and teach. It doesn't want to do the healing and the delivering. Because when you stand and teach, if you're articulate, if you are, you know, you, know, you have a suave way about you, savvy way about you, and you're, you can pull this thing off. You can pull it off. And, you know, people won't even realize there's no Holy Spirit in it because it's just so smooth, smooth. But when it comes to praying for healing and deliverance, be like, well, if there's no power there, we'll be sure people will know. So you kind of pull back. It's a tendency. No. Teaching, preaching, healing, deliverance. The full complement of Jesus' ministry. This same Jesus, John 14, 14 12, he says, whoever believes in me, the things that I do, you will do also. And greater things you will do because I go to the Father. The things that I do, not just the sermons that I preach, the things that I do, the works that I do. Because I go to the Father, what does that remind you? Because I go to the Father, John 16, 7, that if I, don't, if I do not go, the helper will not come. So I'm going to the Father that the helper may come and he may empower you so that you too can do the works that he did in the way that he did. I think that we are, there's a call upon us that we cannot just sidestep. I think about the early church. You know these verses well. Acts chapter 1 verse 4 says, Do not depart, but wait 
for the promise. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But when the Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power. You will be witnesses. The early church, they knew nothing of just going out without waiting, without receiving. Acts chapter 2 verse 1 and 1 to 4. The Spirit came upon them. In the prayer meeting, they saw things, tongues. They heard things. They experienced something. They experienced something. If you say you have received the Spirit, then you experience something changes. Something changes. And there they were extolling, worshiping, talking about the wonderful works of God. And then Peter gets up and preaches. Because the people are saying, what does this mean? It's the same question people ask still till today. What does this mean? And he begins to explain it to them. Chapter 2, verse 33. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. And then they ask another question, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Listen to that. Repent, be baptized, and you too will receive the gift of the Spirit. Repent. The, the guy who repents and turns to Christ, that's great. But he can't say, well, I repented. Have you been baptized? There's something else that you do. Repent, be baptized, receive. You too, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because the promise is for you, says Jesus' ministry, early church. And then you look at the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 9, he's called, he has an incredible encounter with Jesus Christ. And then later Jesus says, Ananias, you know the story well, Ananias goes to him and Ananias says to him, oh, brother Saul, Jesus has sent me to you for the regaining of your sight. The Bible says, so he laid his hands on him that he might regain his sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, come, this guy, this guy met Jesus. How much more filling do you need? Something happened, it's recorded there for us. Regain his sight, filled with the Spirit. The point I'm trying to make here is that as it was for them, it needs to be for us. This same Paul is going to continue his ministry right through 1 Corinthians chapter 2, just quoted a few moments ago to us, that my speech and my message were not just in you know, lofty words, men's wisdom, persuasive words, plausible words. No, it was in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. I love the way it's written there. Demonstration of the Spirit and of power. If it just said Spirit, very easy for us to just, you know, we have come to learn how to, you don't want to say you're a cessationist or so on, so we learn to say things like, yeah, the Spirit said, you know, the Spirit prompted, the Spirit. And we have a vernacular that makes it sound like, yeah, yeah, we're on, on side, but we never go beyond that. Here he said, my message to you was not in just men's wisdom, but it was in a demonstration of the Spirit and power. How did that, how, what did that look like? Demonstration of the Spirit, demonstration of power. We are called, this, 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 this walk we have with Jesus Christ <laughs> is supernatural. You came into the kingdom supernaturally. You're going to be sustained in the kingdom supernaturally. Love the sermon uh, preached here yesterday about the supernatural and how God supernaturally can carry you and lift you to do and live right for him. This is so important. The supernatural. If we don't pursue the things of the Spirit in the way that they did, there are consequences. 
we will end up preaching an anemic gospel. We will end up having a diluted gospel. We'll end up having a deficient gospel, even a destructive gospel. Even a destructive gospel. I say diluted because it's so easy to take everything of the Spirit and just make it so thinned out. So it's there somewhere in your teaching. It's there, it's there a little bit. But it's so thinned out that if, uh, if the Apostle Paul was to come to your church and ask your people, so did you receive the Spirit when you believed? Are they going to be confused by the question? Because if they are, then maybe this thing is too thinned out that they want to say to you, we don't know, what do you mean? Spirit, how, what do you, what do you, what do you? Acts 19, too diluted. Many, many churches in the West, I'm sure other parts of the world, but I live in the West, it has become so diluted that frankly, almost anyone could do that stuff. Anyone could lead the thing because there's no supernatural expected or involved. It's just pragmatic all the way into the ground. We have become so natural thinking and rinsed out everything to do with the supernatural and then we have theological constructions that make it okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. We are called to something deeper. And it takes real integrity to say, and humility to say, Lord, help me, help us. Help us. I say diluted, I say not just diluted, but also deficient. If you sidestep the supernatural, then you're selling them something short, much shorter than what Jesus intended. They are not supposed to become Christians, you know, having come by the Spirit, now you try to do everything in the flesh. You know what that leads to? Confusion. And the reason I say also destructive is that if you don't give them and teach them the full orbed beauty and power of the gospel, they will come in saying, okay, this God is good, this God wants me to live this way, there are sins in my life that need to be fixed. And if the power of the Spirit is not there, and they don't know how to access it, because you don't teach on it, if they don't know how to access it, they're going to end up, A, either becoming legalistic, legalistic disciplines that become legal arthritic in its expression because they're doing their best to try, I must do better, I must do better, I must do better. Not enjoying the, the, the being born by the Spirit that brings you through. Of course, discipline is still necessary, absolutely. But there is a help from the Spirit, a grace and enabling that comes. You are not supposed to do this thing just by yourself or in your own strength. So it either goes to legalism or listen to this, it it tampers with with the underpinnings of their faith. They end up with an a lack of assurance of faith. Because they think, by now I should have changed. By now things should have. It's not quite working for me. And there's a, there's a whole battle that goes on on the inside where they may never talk about it. But they just learn to pretend to be joyful while the battle is raging. Oh, this, is, this, is impo- this is massively important. So there are serious consequences, Pastor, if you don't teach the people about the Holy Spirit, about the fullness in the Spirit. Other consequences, if we just take our good pneumatology, you know, good pneumatology is not good enough. It has to be expressed. It has to be expressed. It has to be lived out. And if we don't do that, then we end up living it in the hands of unreasonable men who in the name of the charismatic do nonsense and put off another generation from things of the Spirit. There's a battle here to be fought for. So I I am grateful for this kind of conference and this kind mm, the centrality of the supernatural. I gave, I, I, well, maybe I won't say that. (laughs) I, I, 
I, I, I, I, I knew what the Lord has put in my heart. I went to Dr. Piper earlier on today. I said, you know, I want to approach this topic this way, this way. and Because I, and I, I just feel, I too am a man under authority, and I, I just want to do the... And, you know, right there he had the opportunity to say... Well, you know, you know, I know that's the title, but can we just rein it in a little bit, keep it safe? And, you know, I wanted to give him just an exit clause here. And he's like, do it. He said, he said, it's your hour. You do it. You go and do it. So that's a dangerous thing to say to a Nigerian guy. <laughs> there are consequences. If we don't do this right, if we don't fight for this, if you don't learn to do ministry by the Spirit, you'll end up doing ministry by pragmatics. You, it's just a natural default. You'll, 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 you'll end up the pastor who is so happy because the band is like Coldplay. Because the sermon was just, just look at the alliteration, look at the points, look at the illustrations. Everything, clever, clever, smooth. And you'll be impressed by that. That's, 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 go and listen to the sermon from yesterday again. That's a very important, insightful. Because it's coming from someone who's walked with the Lord for a while. The danger, listen to me, the danger of becoming like, is it Jeroboam? who God calls him, God calls him, and God says to him, you know what, you're going to have 10, 10, 10 of the nations in this kingdom. Look at 10 pieces, pick it up, you know the story, and he picks it up, God is giving it to him, you're going to rule. And he begins to rule. So God is totally involved, but after a while he's realizing, you know what, having come by God's grace, I'm going to have to you know, keep this thing. Keep it going. And so he falls into the flesh, pragmatics, and then he's going to say to Israel, oh, Israel, Israel, you know what? Why go all the way to the south to worship? We'll make it convenient for you. We'll play to your conveniences and preferences. We'll have an altar here in the north. We'll have another multi-site here. We'll make it all so easy for you. And then we're going to build these two impressive-looking gods. And then, behold, Israel, your gods. I'm not against multi-site, by the way. We're a multi-site church. <laughs> where, did, where did Jeroboam learn all that stuff? You go back and read it. When he went to Egypt, learned their ways. Now he's back and he's beginning to do things the way of the world. Completely natural thinking. The fact that it's growing doesn't mean it's of God. Stop fooling yourself. The fact that it's growing, you know, the last thing you want is you look around and think, this is a good Sunday. Everything is pumping around here. Pastors in the front row high-fiving themselves. Well, this is going cool. <laughs> and then God comes to you and says, this Babylon which you have built with your own hands. The last guy who did that went mad. There are consequences that if we don't learn to grasp the things of the Spirit, we give it to other people, we end up everything devolving into mere pragmatics. But the one command, finally, that the Lord gave to you, go make disciples, you're not doing it. Because the early church didn't know of discipleship making that was apart from the feeling of the Spirit. When Paul goes to Ephesus, Acts chapter 19, and he sees these people, whatever the context was, probably some kind of a small prayer meeting, and he's among them, he's going to plant a church. Very different from the way we do it. We want to do Myers-Briggs and have a whole lot of assessments only. Not him. He's not into, I'm not against Myers-Briggs. But you can, I love what Jason was saying early on. You have the prophetic, is the language I would use, and you have the pragmatics. And the pragmatics are not wrong, but you always have to put the prophetic foot first and let that be the chief determining factor as calibrated and rightly validated by the scriptures. Acts 19, he gets there and he says to them, did you receive the spirit? We haven't heard of it. And he prays for them. And the Bible says they became full, filled with the spirit, speaking in tongues, prophesying. 
It turns out this guy, Paul, is not going to go church planting until these people are disciples. He's not going to go and do it until, until certain things are in place. The consequences. How does a reformed pastor work these things through in the life of a congregation? Why should he even bother? For all the reasons I've just told you. But beyond that, let me tell you this. In Acts chapter 13, I read it to you. In Acts 13, uh, the Bible tells us at the church in Antioch, there are prophets there and so on. And it says, verse th- 2, I think it is, and the Spirit says, separate for me, Saul and Barnabas, for the work that I have called them. The reason I say I'm stepping back and giving a broad scope is this. You, don't, you can't just start with the, everybody wants to go straight into tongues. Tell me about tongues. What, 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 hold your horses. Go back. And think this thing through. The Spirit said the work I have called them. So from the very beginning, your calling is supernatural. Your calling should be supernatural. I, Paul, not of men or by men, but from, by God. So your calling cannot be because I went to seminary. Your calling cannot be because I've been promoted into. Your calling certainly cannot be because there's no one else to do it and I'm transitioning out. That can that is not worthy a way to go about. Your calling has to be the Spirit said. The Spirit called me. That's why I love that story. To say that the Spirit already had been working and this just becomes a confirmation and you see the way it neatly comes together. It can happen is the point. But if you spend all your time reading all these pragmatic books about management styles, you won't even bother asking the Spirit. You pretend to be asking the Spirit, Holy Spirit, God, will you help us to... Right, fine, you move on. Call by the Spirit. Verse 4, it says, and the Spirit sent them. So it's not only the uh, initiation of your calling, it's also the direction of your ministry. The Spirit needs to direct you. The Spirit needs to direct you. The Spirit was directing them. So they went to all these places. It says, and then they proclaimed the gospel. All of this, the, Luke is writing this on purpose that you may know what the Spirit does and how the Spirit worked. That they proclaimed. So the preaching was not just a talk. A talk. It's not a talk. I know we have to speak and I get that language, but with all due respect, it's more than that. Much more than that. It's, 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 it's much more than that. I'm out of words. <laughs> so, to me, it's an amazing thing that God would use someone like me to speak on a Sunday morning the, the word of God, just the best I know how, and he would take those words and do something in the life of a person who just wandered in or giving God the last chance sometimes they say and God touches them and changes them and transforms them that's preaching not suggestions about how you can have a nice you know life nice life the guy we're following died on a bloodstained cross that's a hint not just about a nice life and the good news is he rose again he rose. <laughs> Not just what the Spirit sent, and the Spirit was involved in their preaching, but something very interesting happened. They get to an island, and they see a guy who is a, he's a prophet. Okay, prophet, we, we're Christian, we can do prophet, we get prophet, he's a prophet. Uh, he's a Jewish prophet. Oh, okay, this is not bad. It's got to be a guy on, on, on uh, he's a Jewish prophet. He says, however, he is a false prophet. I'm, I'm, I'm breaking it down like this so you can see that it can look to you like, oh, he's not a bad guy. He looks, there's a symmetry here. He's a false prophet. He's a magician. 
You know, some people will just, you know, he's, he's got some gifts. You may even say he's got spiritual gifts. Really? Spiritual gifts? You need, dear pastor, the gift of discerning of spirits. Because nonsense is going to happen in the house of God, and you wouldn't even know what it is you're dealing with here. That there are times you need to just pull back, Lord, what is going on here? And let him show you. Otherwise, you don't know. This guy, this thing looks okay. I mean, his name was Bar Jesus. What else do you want? What else do you want? Might as well make him pastor. His name is Bar Jesus. <laughs> One day, probably a couple of years ago, finished preaching at Jubilee, walked out. It's a few hundred people walking around the place just at the end of the service and teas and coffee and so on. And I love to just be amongst the people and I'm... And the Holy Spirit arrested my attention and showed me a guy, and I knew there was something wrong. There was something so wrong that I, I left the conversation I was having, and I walked to that guy. He wasn't doing anything wrong. He was just by himself. He was pretty well appointed. He was dressed properly and all this. Just normal. You would, at the natural, nothing wrong with this guy. But there was an urgency in my spirit about that guy with people all over this huge milieu of a moment. I walked up to him and I said to him, is this your first time? He says, it's the first time. Why have you come? Oh, I just came to church. I said, he said, I just came to church and I just, and I said to him, I know you. I'd never met this guy before. And when I said, I know you, I was not addressing the guy. There was a spiritual thing that I could see that God was bringing to my attention and all the lights were going off. This guy looked completely normal. I said to him, I know you. He said, Are we no, I know you. I was pretty firm. To which he said, I just have this problem I'm trying to get rid of. And he confessed what it was, exactly what the Lord has shown me. I didn't even share this with the church. I don't want to freak the people out. <laughs> but the Lord showed me that because there are women here and children here that he wants protected. How are you going to do that as a shepherd if you're not filled with this? How are you going to do that? Just guessing all over the place? I had a chat with that guy. You get to stay if you repent and you're going to change. Or you don't get to come back here anymore. Now, you're probably thinking, whoa, you're not a nice pastor. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. I know that doesn't sound reformed. Yes, I am. Because there's nothing that I've done. It, it's, all, it's, it's, it's a gift. Paul, the Bible says, looked intently at this guy and said to him, you son of the devil, you enemy of righteousness. And he practically cursed the guy. By the time Paul finished, the guy is blind. <laughs> what kind of pastor is this? The guy is blind. No church is going to grow when people go blind like this. What would you do? What do you do when there's a demonic situation in the camp? If you don't, have, if you don't know the things of this, you cannot theologize Satan away. You cannot lecture him away. You cannot hold him away. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to address those situations. This is a supernatural calling. The whole thing is supernatural. It says at the end, the proconsul, he gave his life over to Christ. Verse 12. And not just did he, do, he said, because of what he saw and because of the words that were preached to him. So, Pastor, you need this. This isn't an issue for debate. The early church did not spend their time uh, preoccupied with when did it happen for you. They were preoccupied with has it happened for you, the filling of the Spirit. Has it happened was the issue for them. Uh, the point here is this. You have to daily be filled. So that speaks to everybody, charismatic or whatever you are, charismatic, reform or American. You have to be filled. Have to, for me, 
switch a little bit now to some of the practical sides. I, I, I'm no expert, but I do know that if I will wake up, O oh Lord thy God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsts for you. Everything in me longs for you. Then I know something begins to happen where I don't have to lift my voice in the morning and shout out the how, but with the lifting of my voice, there is a presence of the Spirit that begins to come. And I walk around and I sing to him. I sing songs that I know well. I exalt you, Lord, I exalt you. You're high above the earth. I sing songs that I'm, I'm making them up with just my prayer back to him and honoring him and just walking in, the, in those moments by myself. And the more I do that, something begins to be massaged on the inside and the well that is there begins to flow into rivers of water. And for me, sometimes I will just come forth in tongues. And I am built up, edified, edified. And I know that I have touched something and something has touched me. Listen, Pastor, you need moments like that because you need an encounter with God no matter how small. That's important what I just told you. No matter how small, you need that encounter to do this work effectively. What does it mean to be spirit-filled? It means to be restored to the creator's initial intention so that you have, once again, the relationship and the resources that he wants you to have. The relationship and the resources. I'm quoting Jack Hayford there. The relationship and the resources. To bring you back to that as it was in the beginning. They had dominion over. Well, now so that you can have dominion. They were close to the Oma. Now there is a closeness and an intimacy that you can enjoy. Be fruitful and multiply. Now that can happen because of the fullness of the Spirit. Because of the fullness of the Spirit. Paul, when he spoke to Acts 19 in Ephesus, and he spoke to them, and he prayed for them, and the Bible said they were filled with the Spirit. You go to Ephesians chapter 5, speaking to the same people, writing them letters, saying, verse 18, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Plerus there is the word. Be filled. There's something of a tense and a mood and a voice there. Be filled. The tense there is to continue being filled. Now, no one can just say, I've got it. I've got it all. Really? What all? There's a mood there. That is, it's very, it's imperative. Be, you know, it's, this is not a suggestion. Be filled. There's a voice there. The idea is that you are open to. You are involved. You are active. But the activity that you carry out is, I choose to be open. It's where most people miss it. It's just too simple. I choose to be open. Let me say something about the congregation. How does the pastor bring all of that, the gifts and so on, into the congregation? Well, the first question I think needs to be, how do you see your services, your meeting time? How do you see it? I mean, who is it for? Is it for, I hope it's not for you. I'm sure you know better than that. There's something these days that, oh, no, we're just about the lost. We're about the mission. Everybody's about the mission these days. All the books are about mission. Everybody's about the mission. The mission, the mission. I, I, I get that. I'm all for that. Not at the expense of your, first of all, for God. Where you just jump out on the mission, not even inquiring, not even about God. Our meetings are, first of all, about God. Your meeting needs to be, first of all, about God. That you love his presence. You want his presence. You cry for his presence. You're praying for his presence. Not praying that the sermon goes well. You're praying for his presence. That is the number one prayer point in Jubilee Church. We want your presence here. And I tell you, I once preached on, it was like a vision day. I preached on uh, giving to this thing we're going to do. I gave a call at the end. You know, you just think to yourself, you know, no one who brought a friend today is going to be happy. Their friend, no. I gave a call. People responded to the gospel. And you know, one of the chief ways that people, things I see in the congregation, people crying. 
And when you speak to them, say, why are you crying? Are you okay? They come to the visitor's place. They, why are you crying? They're like, I, I don't even know. But I'm just, they're crying. I'll tell you, they're being taught by the Spirit of God. They've been, the whole atmosphere is full of His presence. I love the way R.C. Pro puts it. says the door frame had the good sense to shake in the presence of God, Isaiah 6. That is exactly what I pray for, that, that, that the inert stuff in here will know that there are a number of people here who love God, who love God, who want the presence of God, who prize the presence of God. That's what to pray for. Before talking about tongues, that's what you want, the presence of God in the meeting. The presence of God in the meeting, because God himself wants to come. Psalm 87, the Bible says that God loves the gates of Zion more than the dwelling places of Jacob. So God loves to come himself if you would just invite him. I don't mean by inviting, Lord, please be with us today. Okay, let's go. No, no. You have to labor and want him and prize him and say, if nobody else is there, Lord, I'll be there. I just want you to be there. Because he can see through you the sincerity of your heart. It's the presence you, it's the presence we need. Love the way Moses says, if your presence won't go with us, let's not go. He loves the gates of Zion more than, he says, this one and that one were born in Zion. So coming together, the house of the Lord becomes a place of life where things happen. People get sprung back into life. The pres- because the presence of the Spirit is there. It says the Lord records those who came to Zion where they find their identity in God. You know, how lovely is your dwelling place? How lovely is your dwelling place? I know you're thinking, would you get to the things of the Holy Spirit, please? This is it. I'll move you into that if I have that, but this is, this is critical to it. Because you're going to end up, if you don't get this, you're going to end up trying to manufacture something. I'm trying to deliver you from that. How lovely is your dwelling place? My soul thirsts, longs for the cause of God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are forever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. They have in them the highways of Zion. The idea is they so love the presence of God, the coming together of God's people, that even going up to the place, they walk through the valley of Baca and they leave it a place of springs. The idea of they are so focused on this one Jesus that frankly they give everything away to be there in Zion. Is that how you teach your people about the corporate? You teach them that, I'm telling you, the pragmatists will take their place. And the sovereign grace of God will take its place. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears in Zion. He says, Lord, here I am. Each one appears in Zion. All my springs are in you. Psalm 87. When that atmosphere is there, when the Lord is invited, when the people are hungry, when the pastor is hungry for God. Okay, pastor, stop that nonsense you do, standing in front, holding a microphone, like your job is to be a continuity announcer. You're more than that. You're the shepherd. Bring bring them to the presence of God and let them see you in the front row with your hands up in the air, intoxicated and hungry for God. Let them see that. That is more than your jolly sermon you're going to preach. Let them just see that and let them see you're hungry for God. But you sit down in the front row, you do your little chat, your little chat, you look around, look around, look around, look around. Then you suddenly get up and say, oh, God is so good. You know, you train them to be thinking this thing is all made up, isn't it? All made up, isn't it? You need to be, I love it. Come here, I see people with their hands up. I talk to our people about these things. So should you. You can see that I have run out of time. <laughs> this happens to all Nigerian poet preachers. <laughs> I 
I'm going to walk you real through, through the next few things. When you have that atmosphere, when the Lord thy God in the midst of thee comes, he becomes mighty. Things begin to happen. No good thing does he withhold. He begins to speak to the people. He begins to give. The Holy Spirit begins to give gifts to the people. And then it's in that atmosphere that the gifts begin to flow and begin to come forth. A word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, prophecy, tongues, interpretation, gifts of healing, gift of faith. And so I'm deciding not to spend time de defining those things because you, you know what? Do yourself a favor. When it comes to the presence of God, buy Terry Virgo's book, Spirit-Filled Church. When it comes to the gift of the Spirit, buy Sam Storm's book, um, uh, Gifts of the Spirit, The Beginner's Guide, or something like that it's called. In fact, I, hear, I heard that it's going to be republished uh, again sometime in the spring, I think. Just put it in your black green now in the spring. Buy that, and you will get all of this stuff well explained to you and with the tension points dissected out for you. And the full complement of the gift is what I pray for. How do you get your people walking in these things? Give you some practical points. Number one, first of all, you know, like I said before, you need to be walking in this thing. You cannot be an, uh, just an actor in front of your people. You have to be real. And then you come out and begin, you start a prayer meeting. That's the first thing I'll say to you. You need to start a prayer meeting. It's so sad when in church life, as soon as time constraints come, the first thing that gets kicked out is the prayer meeting. Foolish idea. You need the prayer meeting. You need to call the church to pray. And if they're not used to you, pastor, need to be there. No, 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 I'm preparing myself. Come to the prayer meeting. Lead the prayer meeting. And then in that context, you begin to, to speak to the people and help them. Does anybody have a word here from the Lord? I'm talking about a prophetic word because sometimes there are impressions that God gives to the, for the way it works for me is this, the way I've seen it work. Does anybody have a And you just begin like a good shepherd to just walk them through gently in the prayer, in that safe context. And you need to be ready for a little bit of a mess around the edges. But if you want it all neatly cut up, forget it. Not just prayer meetings. Regular prayer meetings, I mean, you need that. But you also need times in this life of the church, in the season where you have to, like what, I, what we do, we, we have things we call Holy Spirit mornings. Just probably once a term, Holy Spirit morning, and uh, let the church know about it. And uh, it will usually be a Saturday morning. And I would just speak from the Bible about the Holy Spirit. And then, and then we begin to pray. It becomes a prayer meeting. And then beyond that, gifts begin to flow. Things begin to happen. We pray for the sick. This is how to begin to just walk the congregation through this. And then, of course, you have to teach them. And teach them on a Sunday morning. Teach them well. Teach them carefully. Teach them winsomely, but teach them the scriptures. Finally, the caution. And I'll draw to a conclusion with this. Paul says, let everything be done decently and in order. That is not a suggestion. It's the way it ought to be. There should be order in the house of God. You cannot just have people getting up, shouting, doing whatever they want. When a church is this small, everybody knows each other. It's one thing as it begins to grow and people begin to come and they don't understand this. You need to help the congregation know how it is that we're going to work this thing through decently, tastefully, gracefully, and in order, which means there has to be leadership that is able to say, let two people speak. No, just let this one speak. We're probably not going to be able to take that word for today. Share it with us. We'll share it you know, in a way that we feel it fits or we may not be able to share it today. But the people have been told, this is not a rejection of you, but uh, the leaders must lead, decently and in order. And when people come to our membership course, we let them know these things. Number one, that our freedom in worship will never surrender to fanaticism. You have to teach the people that. Then they know. 
and you describe it for them. Our freedom in worship will not degenerate, will never surrender to fanaticism. You let them know that our openness to the Spirit will never violate the Word. We will bow down to the Word. The Word has the final say. The eternal Word trumps any prophetic word, any time. Therefore, you, may, you need to know the eternal word and let that be calibrated against this. And thirdly, you let them know that our expression of joy will never degenerate into mere excitability. Into mere excitability. Let me let you go to lunch, but before you do, the words of Martin Lloyd-Jones. In pleading the case for acknowledging the need for each believer being baptized in the Holy Spirit as an experience, Martin Lloyd-Jones concludes in saying, may God give us all grace in this matter. Can you say amen to that? May God give us all grace in this matter. It is not a matter for controversy, nor for proving who is right or who is wrong. The issue before us is the state of the Christian church, her weakness, her lethargy, with a world on fire, a world going to hell. We are the body of Christ, but what do we need? We need the power. We need the Pentecostal power, which is in, interesting that a, you know him, Martin Lloyd-Jones, a Calvinist and a Reformed pastor, will talk this way. Shall we not with one accord, mind and spirit during these days wait upon him and pray that again he may open the windows of heaven and shower down upon us the Holy Spirit in mighty reviving power? The need today is for an, authentic, uh, an authentication of God, of the supernatural, of the spiritual, of the eternal. And this can only be answered by, the, by God graciously hearing our cry and shedding forth again his spirit upon us and filling us as he kept filling the early church. A reformed pastor can be charismatic, ought to be charismatic, needs to be charismatic, because he's shepherding the flock of God which he purchased with his blood. Father, we thank you for this day. You know, would you stand up with me? Please stand. Would you just lift your hands like this? Yeah. Would you whisper to the Lord and say, help me. Help me. Teach me. Show me. I don't want to be just another pastor. I want to be one call, directed by you. I need you. I need you. I need you, Lord. And as you raise your hand, you raise it. Those hands with which you do life, you're giving it back to God. And in raising your hand, you're saying, it's not my ministry, it's yours. It's yours. So I need your power. I need your grace. I need your enabling. Father, we need the Holy Spirit. Every pastor here that has traveled here Lord Jesus, that they are hungry for your presence, for your power. Let nobody be left out. Let there be such a hunger in us forever. Such a hunger that will transform us and transform the congregations and transform this nation for you, that we really go on mission for you. Let these hands, oh God, let there be hands that will pray for the sick and they recover. Break us free, Lord, from that Horrible kind of caution that has calcified us to one place. But our hands are raised as children that you might pick us up, lift us up, bear us up. Father, our hands are raised to say, to you be all the glory. Because the kingdom is yours and the power is yours. Let your Holy Spirit find permanent residence in our lives and ministry, all for your glory, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Thank you.